What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we will be covering a few of the devastating discoveries made in the remote Lago Marcino Canyon in Nevada. Lago Marcino Canyon is a remote area located in the Virginia Range, just outside Reno and Sparks, Nevada. Though this canyon is a popular location for hikers to trek along all year long, it is also the location that a vast number of bodies have been dumped and rediscovered throughout the years. In April of 1983, single mother Doris Schindler was in desperate need of some extra help in taking care of her then 10-year-old daughter, Maggie. After asking around the neighborhood of her hometown of Reno, Nevada, Schindler found comfort in the willingness of Zella Weaver to provide extra support. Weaver, a mother and grandmother herself, was a perfect fit to take care of Maggie during weekday afternoons and evenings while Doris worked to support her family. Zella's kindness and expertise in childcare eventually extended her role as Maggie's part-time caregiver on weekdays to the weekends as she began to pick up Maggie from ice skating on Saturdays. It was a Saturday afternoon like any other for 10-year-old Maggie and her nine-year-old friend Carly Via on May 14, 1983. The two ever-energetic young girls got along like two peas in a pod as they both loved ice skating, especially in the springtime. Doris had dropped Maggie and Carly off at the Meadowwood Ice Arena in Reno, as she did every Saturday, and allowed for the girls to skate and have fun for a few hours. Later that afternoon, Maggie and Carly knew that they would have to wait to be picked up by Mrs. Weaver. When Zella Weaver arrived at the Meadowwood Ice Arena that afternoon, she could feel her throat practically drop into her stomach as she realized she could not find Maggie or Carly anywhere. She walked around the length of the parking lot, growing more and more anxious with the lack of response to her constant calling of the girls' names. Beginning to panic, Mrs. Weaver asked some of the staff members working at the ice skating rink if they had seen the girls leave. The staff remarked that they had seen Maggie and Carly exit the arena not too long before Zella arrived, but they could not recall who the girls left with nor if they were in any distress when they left the premises. Terrified at the realization that there was some form of foul play involved, Zella contacted the local police department and Doris to let them know that Maggie and Carly were missing. Local officers from the Sparks Police Department began an investigation right away, hoping to locate the girls as soon as possible and hopefully alive. The case was in a lull for the first few weeks before local law enforcement received a frantic 911 call from two Reno men who had been out shooting in Lago Marcino Canyon on the afternoon of June 7, 1983. While the two men had been hiking to their desired shooting location, they had come across the gruesome sight of two shallow graves along the Lago Marcino Canyon Trail. The shallow graves, officers determined, withheld the rapidly decaying remains of two girls, a mere 50 yards apart. Upon further investigation, the bodies were those of Maggie Schindler and Carly Via. The skulls were both fractured, and the bodies were left under a loose layer of dried dirt. Nearby was a small pair of ice skates and skate guards with Maggie S. written on the side. Their families were notified of the unimaginable truth of the situation and demanded justice be served to whatever monster took their children's lives. Sparks Police Department, having now located the bodies of the two missing girls, still had no real leads on the case as there had been very little evidence to point them in any one direction. That is, until the monster himself confessed inadvertently to the crimes he had committed. On June 14, 1983, just one month after Maggie Schindler and Carly Via had been abducted and murdered, a man by the name of Ricky David Seacrest was being questioned by the police at Sparks Police Department for a completely unrelated grand larceny charge. During his questioning, 
two members of the Reno Police Department recognized Seacrest as the grandson of the Schindler family's babysitter. In fact, the police realized that Seacrest still lived with his grandmother, Zella Weaver, on the same street as the Schindlers. Believing that he could have more information on the case, Officer Bogason and Detective Eubanks of the Reno Police Department introduced themselves to Seacrest and proposed that he answer some of their questions about the disappearance of the two Reno girls. Though no one is quite sure why 22-year-old Ricky David Seacrest gave Reno police an inculpatory statement regarding his role in Maggie and Carly's disappearance, Seacrest recounted that he had frequently been thinking about his grandmother's babysitting schedule as he had essentially memorized it. On that Saturday, Seacrest knew that his grandmother would need to pick Maggie up from the Meadowwood Ice Arena sometime in the early afternoon. Without indicating exactly why, Seacrest admitted that he had decided to go pick the girls up for himself before his grandmother would have the chance to. As both girls knew that Seacrest was Mrs. Weaver's grandson, they were easily coaxed into his truck. After picking up Maggie and Carly from the ice skating rink, Seacrest asked the girls if they wanted to go on a ride. They gleefully agreed. Seacrest drove the girls into Lago Marcino Canyon and suggested that the three of them hike around and hunt for rocks. The girls were eager to explore and go on an adventure, so they continued along the trail with Seacrest without any problems. That is, until, as Seacrest recalled, Carly slipped in the dirt and fell backward, slamming the back of her head into a rock. Seacrest said that he tried to feel for Carly's pulse with no luck, so he assumed that she was dead. At this point, Seacrest noted that Maggie began to freak out on him and cry hysterically as she realized that she and her friend were in a bad situation. Unsure of what exactly she should have done, Maggie made an effort to run away from Seacrest. Seacrest remarked that he knew it was wrong for him to have been out there alone with the girls anyway. So, when Maggie ran, he instinctively caught her. Upon catching her, he swung and hit her in the back of the head with a rock he had grabbed nearby. When she fell to the ground, knocked out by the blunt force of the rock he had hit her with, Seacrest panicked and repeatedly used the rock again and again. Seacrest then quickly ran to his truck to grab a shovel that he had said to have always kept in his vehicle. He returned to where he had left the girls and thought that Carly may have still been alive, despite having hit her head on a rock. Seacrest took the edge of his shovel and used it to hit Carly once or twice in the head, before finally deciding to bury both girls under some loose dirt nearby. The forensic pathologist who testified at Seacrest's trial stated that it was highly unlikely that Carly had fallen on a rock and died. It was evident that Seacrest had used the shovel more than he claimed. The jury in Reno presiding over Ricky David Seacrest's case found him guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of first-degree kidnapping. In turn, Seacrest was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On December 1, 2017, Seacrest died in Carson Tahoe Hospital due to reasons never released to the public. The psychiatrist originally assigned to his trial mentioned to the jury that Seacrest was an incurable sociopath who felt no remorse for his actions. Though the families of Maggie Schindler and Carly Villa will never be able to see their bright-eyed daughters again. The monster who took their lives was met with consequences and eventually his maker. Unfortunately, the list of bodies discovered throughout the Lago Marcino Canyon in Nevada does not stop at Maggie Schindler and Carly Villa. In their quaint Idlewild Drive apartment complex in Reno, seven-year-old Monica Da Silva enjoyed a relaxing evening with her mother father, and younger brother James on September 23, 1990. The four members of the Da Silva family enjoyed a nice dinner together, as they always did, and decided to finish off the remainder of the night by watching a movie. 
After the movie ended, the collective family snuggle on the couch came to an end. Monica's mother and father said goodnight to Monica and her five-year-old little brother as they tucked themselves into their respective beds in their shared bedroom. Monica's mother and father were completely unaware that when they said goodnight to their children around 11 o'clock that fateful fall night, it would be the last time they would ever see Monica. At some point throughout the night, an unknown individual had managed to prop open the window to Monica and James's bedroom, located on the ground floor of the parents' apartment in Reno. After doing so, the individual made an effort to remove Monica from her bed as she slept, without waking James. It was not until Mr. and Mrs. De Silva entered Monica and James's room to wake them up for breakfast the next morning that they realized the bedroom window was ajar and Monica was nowhere to be found. Assuming at first that she was playing some sort of game, they searched around the room for Monica to no avail. Panic set in suddenly as the De Silvas realized something had gone terribly wrong while they slept. They called the Reno Police Department immediately and an investigation began that same morning. Much like the disappearance of Maggie and Carly, the investigation had no real leads for the first few weeks after Monica went missing. In fact, nearly three weeks after she was abducted, a family hiking through Lago Marcino Canyon made a 911 call explaining that they believed to have come across human remains along one of the trails. Officials who responded to the frantic call found a skull, ribs, a collarbone, and hair follicles where the remains were reported to have been found. However, the Reno Police Department thoroughly dropped the ball when determining to who the remains had belonged. It was not until a full 10 months after the remains were discovered that forensic pathologists were able to identify the abandoned body as that of Monica De Silva's. Though the police repeatedly admitted that delaying the identifications of the remains was a massive mistake. Monica De Silva's case nonetheless grew colder and colder by the minute. In July of 2011, Reno police were on the verge of what they had hoped to have been a new lead in the Monica De Silva case. Back in November of 1986, seven-year-old April Marie Rhodes was abducted from the bottom bunk of a bunk bed she shared with her younger brother in the middle of the night, sometime after 11 p.m. Much in the same way that Monica's parents had realized she was missing, April's parents came to wake up her and her brother and noticed that April had not been in her bed. However, April's body was discovered by North Las Vegas police a few hours later in a vacant storage room. The assumed culprit of the abduction and murder of April Marie Rhodes was a registered sex offender by the name of Jasper Everett Goddard, who was 62 years old at the time of his arrest in 2011. Goddard had been wanted since 1986 on a felony warrant regarding April's death. The Reno Police Department had been closely monitoring the similarities between April's case and that of Monica's. Both girls were seven years old at the time of the abduction. Both girls were abducted in relatively the same fashion, through the window of their parents' apartments around 11 p.m. Both girls had younger brothers present in the bedrooms they had gone to sleep in, yet neither of their brothers was harmed. Both of the victims' bedrooms were on the ground floor of their apartment buildings. Both of the girls' families were of the same socioeconomic status. The similarities between the two disappearances and subsequent murders of April Marie Rhodes and Monica De Silva could not be overlooked by neither the North Las Vegas Police Department nor the Reno Police Department. However, when the investigation into Jasper Everett Goddard's role in either of the girls' disappearances was brought into question, it was determined that he had only been responsible for April's case. Police reported no forensic evidence to show that April and Monica's cases were linked, nor that the same man committed them. Jasper Everett Goddard 
eventually pleaded guilty to killing April Marie Rhodes in January of 2019, though he ended up dying suddenly that same year before he had received his sentencing. To this day, the Reno Police Department has been unable to bring closure to Monica De Silva's family, who had to bury their daughter without so much as an idea of who the monster was that tore their family apart. As Monica's case has gone cold, anyone with information regarding the identity and or whereabouts of her killer should contact Reno Police Department. Her family wishes for justice to be served. Monica's remains should not be just another Lago Marcino Canyon statistic to be swept under the rug. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. A playlist is going to pop up right now with more videos you'll love. See you guys next time.